from Australia to Belgium, from San Francisco to Singapore, welcome to today's edition of the Wednesday webinar series. Currently, we are in the third out of four webinars in our series on the repair and presentation of marine structures. My name is Chris Ball. I'm with Vector Corrosion Technologies, and I will be your, your host today. I would like to mention as we get started here that today's webinar is being recorded and will be available at a later time for your, your viewing. This webinar series is sponsored by the Concrete Preservation Alliance. The Concrete Preservation Alliance is a growing coalition of organizations committed to advancing the best practices in the field of concrete preservation and infrastructure renewal. Basically, the focus on the Concrete Preservation Alliance is to promote best practices for repair and corrosion protection and sustainable solutions. The home of the Concrete Preservation Alliance is wesafestructures.info. The members. The members of the Concrete Preservation Alliance are Vector Corrosion Technologies, VCS, NDT Corporation, Vector Construction, and a plethora of other uh, business partners around the world. If you register for today's webinar, you've already been to the wesafestructures.info site. The wesafestructures.info website is the digital home of the Concrete Preservation Alliance. Today's presentation and video, uh, as well as uh, information from previous webinars are hosted under the events tab and that will be available in the next few days after today's webinar. This is also where you register for upcoming webinars, so come back frequently and visit. And I'd also just like to mention under the resources tab, the environmental calculator that's available for use where you can enter the amount of volume of concrete that is gonna be repaired and maintained in place and, uh, and see what the impact is that from a sustainability standpoint. Want to mention, um, you see at the top of the, uh, of the page here, the Q&A tab, we encourage you to submit questions uh, and we will have some time at the end to go through uh, some of those for sure. And uh, we would like to put out there that if you submit a question, you qualify for a gift card if Jason believes that you have the most, uh, the best, of, the best and most interesting question. But to qualify, you need to use your name uh, in the in the submission. So as you see, Jason uh, here, Jason Chodacek is our presenter today. Jason's been with Vector for over 25 years. Uh, he's based in Florida, and uh, he has developed a specialty for corrosion in the field of marine structures, and in particular uh, focuses on, on the technology development and, uh, and project support for galvanic jackets for pile protection. So without further ado, let me turn it over to Jason. All right. Thank you, Chris. <clears throat> I'm just getting ready to share my screen here. Go, oh, I think we should be uh, good to go. So, thank you, everybody, for uh, for joining us on um, for here well, in, uh, on the East Coast for this afternoon's presentation, and I'm sure for uh, some others um, for the uh, for the morning as well. So. Um, I'm just going to go through a, a brief outline here of what we're going to cover um, during this presentation. And I'm going to start with, we're going to start with uh, why do we need uh, corrosion protection um, for uh, reinforced concrete structures um, or specifically piles. Um, and it can be anything from uh, concrete piles to steel, re steel piles as well. Um, the second thing that we're going to talk about is the, the environments or the exposure conditions. So what does the uh, exposure conditions or the environment that these piles are in have to do with any of your choices uh, for corrosion protection? And then uh, thirdly, we're going to talk about some of the previous solutions that have been used in the past 
um, and talk about, you know, some of their limitations that they have and as to why um, cathodic protection um, is a quite a popular choice um, for extending the, the service lives of these uh, of these piles. Um, the different types, we're going to go through a few of the different types of the cathodic protection systems um, or specifically the galvanic uh, uh, galvanic systems for pile protection. And then uh, we're going to uh, finish it off with some of the advancements or some improvements, um, some new improvements that are uh, coming forward within the uh, um, within the corrosion protection systems for um, a number of these different structures as well. So. Uh, why do we, uh, you know, why do we need corrosion protection? Um, well, in the tidal zone, um, we have a lot of exposure to salt water, especially in a marine environment. We have the salt water. We also have that continued wetting cycle that is constant right in that in the tide. So you have that up and down motion of the water um, twice during the uh, during the day. And what that does is it brings a lot of moisture and a lot of oxygen. And also you have your chlorides in there as well. And with all of these chlorides, the moisture, the oxygen, it basically results in a lot of corrosion that takes place um, either on uh, conventional reinforced piles, pre-stressed uh, reinforced piles, or even your conventional steel pipe piles or H pile. Um, and so then why is salt water, why is so, salt water so damaging or so aggressive um, to all of our reinforcing steel um, uh, within the uh, marine environment? Well, basically what it is is salt water has a lot of dissolved ions or it has a lower resistivity um, or it's much more conductive as compared to fresh water. Um, so uh, corrosion is an electrochemical reaction. So when we have a lot more ions, um, or a lower resistivity, basically Ohm's law states that we're gonna have a much higher current flow or a higher corrosion rate. So basically anything or any sort of a structure, especially uh, our piles that are in a saltwater environment, we're gonna have a lot more aggressive corrosion taking place and especially because of that tidal, um, that tidal uh, surge where we have a lot of oxygen and, uh, and as well moisture present. So this brings me on to the next topic is uh, pile exposure conditions and and um, and in with the uh, pile exposure conditions, there's a number of different um, different scenarios that piles are or environments that piles are exposed to. So the first area that we have is actually the underwater area. And so everything basically for the pile is going to be uh, under the water, right? It's all going to be encompassed in, in the seawater or salt water. Um, so we have a, a really good electrolyte to work with here. And then as we move up the pile, we're going to move into our tidal zone or our regular kind of peer, our, our tidal zone area. This is the area that is constantly wetted and dried over and over uh, throughout the day. So there's a lot of moisture, a lot of chlorides present, a lot of oxygen. And then as we move farther up the pile, we get into kind of our splash zone or our periodic um, wetting area. This is usually due to storm events, um, could even be boat traffic. So it typically isn't, um, uh, it's not getting submerged daily, but on, you know, on occasion um, it can be wetted and contaminated uh, with chlorides that way. And as we move further up on the pile, um, we get into our atmospheric area or our, our dry area that sometimes we call it. And this is an area that gets exposed to chlorides, but it's due, due to atmospheric chlorides. So if you ever go to a beach, um, you know, spe specifically on the ocean and you see the waves crashing, you're going to end up seeing a mist and there's basically a salt haze or a salt mist. And so this is the area that's basically gets exposed to uh, um, to these atmospheric chlorides. And the one thing to note in all four of these areas, all of these areas or all of these conditions or environments can be very, very corrosive to piles, regardless whether it's concrete or uh, uh, bare steel piles as well. So the next thing I'm going to talk about is some of the or go through or some of the past solutions to our pile corrosion. So there's been a number of things that have been done in the past. Um, one of them is actually just basically to use a, a mass a steel pile. So we just have a steel pile that we place in the environment. Uh, we know it's going to start co uh, corroding. It's not coated. So as soon as we place it in the environment, it begins to corrode, right? 
and uh, we're not doing anything to protect it. We're just, we just have enough mass of steel there and it's gonna continue to corrode. The next thing that we have or that has been done is coated steel piles. So as everybody knows, um, coatings are never 100% perfect. There's lots of holidays or pitting um, within a coating and you eventually get a coating failure. And as you get this coating failure, it becomes very, very aggressive in here. And sooner or later, your coating is just going to have a complete failure. It's also very, very difficult to actually do any sort of uh, uh, repairs to your coating system uh, in here um, because you have to basically cough or dam or do something to that extent so that you can come in and do some sort of uh, uh, in, in order to repair your uh, coating. The next uh, system that I'm going to move on to is uh, basically is a, a fiberglass epoxy filled jacket. So it consists of a fiberglass form um, as you can see on this pile here in the center of the pit in the center of the, the uh, screen is is a fiberglass uh, jacket that's placed around a concrete pile and it also could be a steel pile and it's filled with uh, with an epoxy grout and you can see that the pile was filled with this epoxy grout and you can just see some of the epoxy on the outside of the uh, of the fiberglass jacket so what ends up happening is when you put that around there there's still chlorides oxygen and moisture that was trapped underneath this jacket or underneath of this uh, this epoxy grout and even with these chlor even with the chlorides and the oxygen been behind there, it continues to corrode. Um, the thought was that if we put this jacket around it with the epoxy, that we could at least maybe choke off the corrosion and prevent the corrosion from occurring. But it actually continues underneath of the jacket. And then one thing to note is, is this jacket here that you're looking at, this is the actual jacket that was removed. So there's all this corrosion that's occurring underneath of these stay in place jackets and the corrosion isn't visible. So we were unaware actually of all the damage that actually was occurring to the reinforcing steel or the, in this case, the pre-stressing strands within that pile. So something that is that has also been done in the past that is very similar to the epoxy uh, filled uh, jackets is basically it's kind of like a mass concrete jacket and it again is a fiberglass uh, a fiberglass form stay in place fiberglass form um, that's placed around the pile and then it's just filled with uh, concrete grout and it was designed to basically try to perform the same thing that we did with the epoxy uh, grouted jackets as well but what ends up happening is you still have chlorides and oxygen and moisture that remain behind and so the corrosion continues and as I mentioned in the previous example, is it's hidden from view. So you can actually get some pretty significant corrosion that's occurring under there that's actually not even visible to you when you come out to do a visible inspection on the jackets. So this brings me into to, uh, one of the other past solutions that actually was more of, of uh, a cathodic protection uh, solution. And uh, this is going to be just for this underwater area and for the tidal zone or that area where you have that that regular tide flow up and down. And so this was actually an expanded zinc mesh cathodic protection jacket that was actually developed uh, in the 90s by the Florida DOT. It was designed for that tidal zone protection. And so what it consisted of was it was a zinc mesh anode that can be basically installed inside of a jacket or uh, um, it's inside placed inside of a jacket and it's uh, a fiberglass uh, form is also used in this in this type of a jacket system. And so you can see here on the right side, the zinc mesh was going to be pre-installed around the pile, then the fiberglass jacket was going to be placed around it afterwards. Um, what ends up happening is basically the salt water wicks up from the bottom of this jacket. The salt water keeps the zinc in an active state and it provides galvanic protection this way. 99% or the majority of these jackets all used also a bulk uh, hull zinc anode. Um, so this is just an off the shelf uh, zinc anode that was actually used on uh, boat hulls. And this is actually attached to the bottom side of the jacket. And this protects everything in the uh, basically in that wet zone. 
So if we move on to here, you can see that we have our uh, salt water. Our salt water enters the bottom of the jacket and you can see that the salt water in the tidal zone goes up and down. So we have that salt water that's traveling up and down inside of the uh, fiberglass jacket. And basically what it's going to do is it's going to saturate that zinc mesh inside of the jacket. So this area that gets saturated or the area that comes in contact with the zinc mesh, basically it's going to corrode or oxidize. And as it oxidizes, it's going to actually provide uh, uh, protection to our reinforcing steel that is within our pile. So the electrons are flowing to our reinforcing steel. Our zinc is basically cathodically protecting or galvanically protecting our reinforcing uh, steel within the pile. And it's just a sacrificial system relying upon the dissimilar metals. So, so we have our area of cathodic protection. So any of basically the area within that kind of tidal zone, we're getting some galvanic current in there. Um, again, like I mentioned previously, we have our bulk hull anode that's basic that's attached to the underside of our pile here. And one thing to note as well is is from um, you know from a number of different installations is is the bulk anode can be consumed sometimes in as little as five years. So why is that? Why is the bulk anode being consumed in five years? Um, and and why is there some limitations on this first generation jacket? So. Essentially what ends up happening is the lower portions of the jacket um, basically receives all of that galvanic protection. And if you if you remember me mentioning, um, as we move far farther up the pile, we start to move up into the areas of the pile where we actually don't have any salt water um, uh, that's, that's present. So without the salt water present, we cannot activate the zinc within the jacket. So the higher that we move up, basically the more passive the zinc becomes. And uh, there was actually, there's been a number of different field trials and, and as you move farther up on the jacket systems, higher up away from the splash zone, um, basically the zinc is producing um, smaller and smaller amounts of galvanic current. This is just an example of some of the zinc mesh that was removed. Um, and you can see that there was a little bit of corrosion that had taken place, but over a 17 year time, um, not a lot of the zinc had been consumed. So a lot of the galvanic currents coming um, off of the bulk anode and even in the lower portions of that jacket, just in that tidal zone. So what can be done? What can we do? Um, now I'm going to be moving on to talk about some of the improvements that can be done. So we know that this first generation jacket works. You know, there's been a lot of studies on it. We know that it provides some protection down in that tidal zone or splash zone. So what can we do to improve on that? So how can we move this protection or how can we get this protection? Um, how can we increase it to higher levels on the pile? You know, what can be done with it? Well, what we could do is we could increase we could increase the zinc anode exposure to salt water um, and by doing this we're basically increasing the wetting zone and as we're increasing the wetting zone we're just exposing our zinc to more uh, to basically more activation and we're stopping the zinc from passivating potentially we'd stop it from passivating so if we're able to do this we're going to increase our performance and then as well like you saw in the last picture, um, you know, we can also then increase our utilization of our zinc. It's not going to passivate, so we can get a lot more galvanic current. By doing this, by providing this type of an improvement and getting it higher, we can then provide actually protection. So not just to that tidal zone, but then we can also provide protection to that periodic uh, splash zone where you know it's not wetted um, and it's only wetted occasionally. So if we can, uh, you know, if we can provide a jacket that can actually provide uh, more galvanic current higher up, we're going to get an added benefit of basically extending um, the uh, extending the uh, cathodic protection uh, or that galvanic cathodic protection higher up. So. One of the methods that uh, that uh, was designed was it was called the tidal uh, Galvashield Tidal Plus, and the way that this can increase uh, current output or galvanic current is it relies relies on a, a cast zinc anode. It's not an actually an, it's not an expanded zinc mesh anode. It's a cast zinc anode. So think of it as a larger bar of zinc and it's actually going to be embedded in a concrete jacket. So you can see that there's a concrete substrate there. We have our cast zinc anode, 
But one of the big things to look at here or to notice is that we actually have a wicking fabric that's actually around the zinc, uh, around the zinc core. So this thing is going to do two things. It's this wicking fabric is actually going to bring salt water up to the higher elevations of this anode so we can increase the uh, activation of the zinc and thus obviously increasing the galvanic current up to the higher higher elevations of a pile but it's also providing a protective barrier between the zinc and uh, and the the concrete we typically see concrete as being uh, a higher ph kind of in an environment but for zinc it actually um, uh, starts to passivate when it's embedded in uh, uh, concrete. So if we can keep the zinc away from the concrete with this wicking barrier, we can also prevent our uh, zinc mat or our zinc uh, from passivating. So um, what does all this mean? Basically, it's just a wicking barrier and it also increases the activation and utilization of the uh, of this zinc anode. So I'm just going to go through some of the components here of the of the uh, jacket system and so what you have is you actually have the the wicking fabric anodes that are basically hung on the pile and these are hung around the pile and it can be round piles square piles steel piles h piles you know variety of different types of piles they can be used on and what you have is you have that wicking tail that is actually extending out of the bottom of the jacket so that wicking tail sticks out and that allows that actually that salt water to wick up and down that bar anode um, that's hanging on the pile. So as it flows up and down, it activates the zinc and all of these anodes are connected at the top and you can see there's a, basically an anode header wire that it's all connected to. And there's an optional junction box that's actually uh, that can be used at the top. So you can direct connect the system right to the reinforcing steel. You can see that there's a continuity groove in the pile there where it's actually uh, all of the steel within the pile is exposed. This allows you to go in, make sure that all of that steel within the pile is electrically continuous. So you can either make a direct connection with the anodes to that steel, or as in this example here, we have our anode wires running up to the junction box along with the bulk anode wire. There's basically a switch and a couple other components up in there. And then on the opposite side, there's a black wire or the cathode wire that comes back down to your reinforcing steel. So, and what does this do? The system basically increases your cathodic protection or that galvanic current, and especially to those higher zones or the higher elevations within the, uh, on that pile. So here's just a short uh, demonstration of how it works. So we have that, that wicking tail, the salt water is going to wick up the, uh, the, the wicking fabric. It's going to go up, keep all of the zinc in an active state, and we basically get that increased activation to the higher elevations of the pile. So here's some actual pictures of what the system looks like. Um, on the left side here, you can actually see there's the bare zinc bar. It's actually put inside of that wicking fabric or that wicking fabric is placed around the, the, the outside of the, uh, the zinc bar. Um, and then there's a, a bulk anode and assembly that's typically used. And then we have our junction box, the optional junction box. And again, there's just a number of wires. Our anode wires go up. We have a shunt on the inside. The shunt allows you to measure the uh, uh, the voltage across the shunt or a known resistance, and this allows you to uh, actually calculate the amount of current um, that is flowing in the system. And you can you can find or uh, evaluate the jacket um, using this method as well. So this is an actual project here where uh, where the uh, the Tidal Plus jackets were installed. Um, it was actually a rail bridge in northern Florida here, and this is actually on the St. Johns River. And so we have our pile on the left. So there was a, a bunch of concrete damage that had been done to it. Um, it was decided that it need to be structurally reinforced. So on the left side, you can see that there's a new cage of steel that's been added to this pile of repair as well. So the anodes were actually placed on the inside of this cage of steel. They were all wired up. Basically, there's that header wire. It's all wired up. All the red wires are just temporarily being hung on the side of the pile cap there. And then there were all of the connections made to the reinforcing steel within the pile and to the reinforcing steel cage, the new cage that was placed around the pile. 
Those are then temporarily hung up. You can see that there's actually some pumping tubes there. So you can either use some pumping ports to pump these jackets, or you can use pump tubes to basically tremi and fill the jacket this way. As well here in the center picture here, we have a, a PVC stay in place form. Some of the other previous examples, we had some fiberglass stay in place forms. So there's a couple of different options that you have there and there's uh, certain benefits to each of the systems. So they place this form around it. They're just going to get ready to brace it. So you want to brace the jacket systems just so that they can maintain shape um, during the pumping process. And there on the right side, it was finished. It was completely filled. And then typically there's a 45 degree chamfer placed on the top just to help other water uh, and splash and everything to, to help it run off. Uh, there was a junction box used on this one as well. And all the wires were uh, uh, routed to the junction box and then uh, and then the jacket was energized or turned on. So, so now that we've installed this, what is the performance difference actually between the tidal mesh jacket or the expanded mesh jacket versus the Tidal Plus jacket, right? So we know that we can get more activation or increased activation. We can get better utilization of the uh, of the uh, Tidal Plus or the bar anode in there with the wicking technology. And so what does that mean? How much more are we getting out of it? You know, we're also, um, so, so we went in and there was a number of different jacket systems that were monitored. And so one thing to note here is just on the bottom, here's the first generation. It's the expanded zinc mesh um, jacket. And so you can see the average anode current output here on the left, and it was monitored over a number of years as well. And if we come in and look at the Tidal Plus version of it, you can see that we've actually got quite a bit more current off of the same, um, basically the same type of uh, uh, length of jacket. So what did we get out of it? Um, we're basically, we can get anywhere from 10 to 20 times the amount of current output from these jackets. And a big reason for that is, is because we're able to move that salt water up into the higher elevations um, of these uh, wicking anodes and get some better performance and better utilization out of it. So, so that's another way, that's just another, um, um, update in terms of uh, improvements to the uh, to the tidal jacket that has been done in the in the uh, most recent years. So then what do we do when we start to move up into the atmospheric area or that dry zone? So when we start to move up there, there's a limitation even with the wicking anode or with the tidal plus anode. As we start to move higher and higher, um, we can only get that capillary action can only go so high. So what happens when we get outside of that zone and we're in that atmospheric area um, or that uh, that dry zone where we have the airborne chlorides? So, so we can we know down here in the lower portions we can rely on the salt water to activate zinc, but as we move into the higher portions, we do not have any salt water that's available. And if you actually look at the corrosion rate of zinc um, versus pH. Zinc actually corrodes either in a low pH environment or in a high pH environment. So we're going to look at trying to use one of these environments to keep the zinc in an active state because we have no salt water that's available. Without that salt water, we can't keep it activated. So let's try and figure out something else. What else can we use to activate it? So. So zinc oxidizes, as I mentioned, in both a low and a high pH environment. So um, a high pH environment actually is beneficial to reinforcing steel. So what we're going to do is we're going to rely on a high pH environment or a high alkalinity environment because this high alkaline environment or a high pH environment actually oxidizes the zinc or keeps the zinc uh, actively corroding. So we can actually get a good corrosion rate um, or a higher current output by using or utilizing this high pH uh, environment. So this technology was actually introduced in 2004, so it's been in use for uh, you know almost uh, 20 years. And uh, and the one thing to note with it again is is because we're using this, or it can be used in the higher elevations, is is the salt water is not required. So what it relies on is it's basically an anode or a zinc anode that's actually encased in a high pH material, and this basically activates the zinc. 
um, allowing it to basically provide uh, corrosion current. And so we don't need salt water. Salt water does not need to wick up and down inside of the, uh, uh, the jacket. Um, and it also, one of the other things that can be done is once you get into brackish water, where maybe your chlorides or your salt levels are not high enough to activate the zinc in a traditional zinc mesh or the, uh, or the uh, Tidal Plus, the wicking anode, we can use these anodes as well in a brackish water environment um, because we're not relying on that salt water. Another thing to note is it can also be used in a freshwater environment and dry land applications. So sometimes if you're even thinking of some of the uh, um, the uh, de-icing salts and some of the bridges and substructures up uh, in the uh, more in the dry land areas, these, this can also be used there. So, and again, it can be used in the brackish water, salt water, all these applications. So sometimes there may be an application where you will still want to use a bulk zinc anode. So it would still be attached uh, below this jacket if you were using it in that wet zone or that submerged zone. So, so we don't have the salt water. Salt water is not entering the bottom. We have our zinc anodes embedded in that high alkaline, high pH mortar, right? So we know that high pH keeps the zinc in an active state, and that's how we're going to provide, or we're going to have the anodes providing this galvanic current. So here's, I'm just going to go through another project here where it was, uh, where it utilized the, uh, the uh, DAS or the alkali activated uh, anodes. One thing to note, you can look here on the right side, you can see in this picture, the anodes were pre-installed on some stay-in-place forms, some fiberglass stay-in-place forms. The anodes can also be pre-attached. It does not have to be attached to the fiberglass forms. Um, so they can be pre-installed around the pile, just like the, uh, the Tidal Plus or the Wiki anodes were installed. Um, just depends on the type of the job and, uh, and how it was specified. So you're gonna come in, you're gonna take these, uh, these jackets, you're gonna place it around, around your structure around your columns or your piles. And then uh, and then again, if you and fill it with grout, and then again, if it's going to go down into the water, then you're gonna use the appropriate bulk anode if required. So this project here, this is actually a project in Florida, getting down closer to, uh, it's in West Palm. And uh, it was actually a drawbridge here. And you can see that there were some columns that were not exposed to the tidal conditions, but it was in a periodic wetting zone. So boat traffic, storm events. So there was a lot of saltwater contamination on the lower portions of this structure here. So it actually originally had arc spray or metallizing spray on it. And you can see here where the metallizing spray has actually been removed and the concrete repairs were being completed. So you wanna come in, remove obviously any of the uh, delaminated um, concrete and if you see in the middle of the picture there, you can actually see that groove. That's that continuity groove that I was talking about previously. So what they did was they exposed all of the reinforcing steel all the way around. And then they wanted to make sure that this is electrically continuous. And it may be hard for some to see, but if you look right in the middle, you can actually see there is a steel wire that's actually been actually welded to each of those bars to make sure that there's continuity because we want to make sure that all of that steel within that column or within the pile there is uh, actually uh, continuous or electrically continuous. So then after they do all of that, they remove the concrete, they have the continuity corrected. You're going to come in and you're actually going to take the, uh, the stay in place forms with the anodes either attached or uh, pre-attached and you're going to come in and place the jacket and the anodes around the around the structure. You're going to place it around. You're going to brace it. In this example here, you can see that there were some holes in the jacket here. Those are actually the pumping ports. So you can either use pumping ports to pump your grout um, in. Typically, you're going to have a number of ports on opposite faces of the structure. You're going to pump them in a fashion so that you don't have so that you you get. Uh, um, good grout flow within the within the jacket system, or you can even use the tremi method or the pump tubes as well. So the uh, bracing is removed after the uh, grout has set, and you can see here on the top right, it's a little bit more difficult to see, but there's actually a junction box on this one, and you can see the wires that are hanging out of it. 
So uh, a cathodic protection engineer or an A specialist has to come in and basically energize it or turn the system on now. Um, and again, the junction box is not required. Um, it could have been direct connected as well. Um, so anyways, they're going to come in on this example here. They're going to make a number of the connections and uh, connect it to the uh, uh, within the junction box. So this is a number of them that were completed. And you can see that obviously the tidal zone uh, these jackets were not going to be in the tidal zone. So the wicking anode um, or the expanded zinc mesh anode, so the tidal or the tidal plus anode would not have performed in this area. And this is why we had to go to an activated, uh, an activated jacket system as well. One thing to note on these is uh, for this as well, there was a lot of testing that's been done on these. So even those footers are actually receiving cathodic protection from those jackets. Uh, so in this example here, those jackets are actually producing a large amount of uh, galvanic current or cathodic protection current. So, so those are examples of all of the different types of jackets, um, you know, that are available and some of the improvements that have been done. So is there anything else that we can do? Is there anything else that can be done to these jacket systems to, to make some improvements or to get some better protection out of it? So one of the things that we've been looking at is, is all of these jackets have utilized a standard, you know, hull anode that have been used on ships previously. So they've been designed specifically for a ship. Is there anything that we can do to this anode that we, that um, we can make more effective or to work better with the jacket systems um, with these galvanic jacket systems. Another thing is, is typically what's been done is there's been one bulk anode or one hull anode that's been attached to each pile, um, regardless of pile size. So whether you had an 18 inch pile or you have a one meter diameter pile, they all got one anode, 148 pound bulk anode, uh, hull anode. So should we be looking at adding two anodes, three anodes, a larger anode, uh, something that's that's heavier, something that's maybe lighter. What about many piles that are located together? So for example, in this in this picture, we have our the pile in the center. What if we were only going to jacket and cathodically protect this pile in the center here? Um, do any of those other piles have any influence on this cathodic protection jacket that we have in there? <clears throat> so if you think about this, if your reinforcing steel from your pile is continuous through your deck or your pile cap, all of those other piles would be electrically continuous with the pile we're trying to protect. So if we put a bulk anode on this center pile with a jacket, we're actually going to try to cathodically protect all of the other piles in the vicinity of this pile. So we're artificially going to reduce the lifespan of this jacket because it was only designed to be put on this one pile. So maybe we should be looking at the structure as a whole or at least the piles around it um, and not just the, the individual pile. So in terms of, of uh, um, improvements to uh, a hull anode or the, the standard zinc anode that we use, um, one of the things is, is zinc is actually toxic. So um, it's toxic uh, to a certain extent to shellfish. Um, and there's a number of different um, species that are can be basically uh, harmed by this. So especially in shipyards, um, ports and stuff like that, where maybe you have a lot of ships or you have a lot of piles and you have a, a, a large amount of these bulk anodes, uh, zinc bulk anodes that are uh, attached to the structure. Um, the EPA actually uh, uh, considers um, zinc at certain concentrations to be toxic, um, whereas aluminum is not regulated by the EPA and is not seen as being uh, toxic. So can we use aluminum, an aluminum bulk anode on these zinc jackets? And, uh, you know, can a different alloy or can aluminum be used? And basically the short answer is, is there's been a, we've done a lot of work on this and yes, we can use an aluminum uh, anode on these jacket systems. Um, and so it is compatible with these jacket systems. Another thing is, is what size of an anode should we be using? As I mentioned previously, we've only traditionally been using um, one anode, you know, a hull 48 pound zinc hull anode on all different sizes of the piles, regardless whether you have 30 feet of 
uh, exposed pile within that water column or whether you have five feet on, and regardless of the diameter. So shouldn't we be looking at the design of the bulk anode um, as well? Not just the design of the jacket system, but a design of the bulk anode uh, should be included in it. So um, as well, the continuity of the piles and also the spacing. Remember I mentioned that uh, if you're trying to protect just a variety of the piles in there and not every single pile, what influence or effect do the other piles have on your uh, cathodic protection system or your galvanic system um, within that local area? So, so the aluminum anode, um, basically we have come up with and designed an aluminum anode um, that is compatible with these jacket systems. So it's environmentally friendly. And one of the other benefits too with aluminum is in a saltwater environment, um, it actually produces a lot more current. So it's a lighter anode or it's a lighter alloy, but it actually produces a higher current. Um, so it's got a higher current density as compared to zinc. So it's also a little bit lighter, so it's going to be easier for the contractor to install. And then as well, it is now being designed for a specific size and weight and shape. So it's not just something that's being pulled off the shelf. There's an actual a specific purpose to the design. And so there may be more than one anode that's used per pile, depending upon the size and and how much of the pile is actually in that in that water column as well. So. And uh, so what is the difference um, between the outputs or the current outputs or the amount of protection that we actually get between the uh, the zinc anode, that traditional hull anode and our uh, um, aluminum anode? So we've actually done a number of testing here and you can actually see here that the zinc actually, so you have your galvanic current here on the left side of the graph and we have our basically our output here. So you can see the zinc and the aluminum here and you can see that increased output from that aluminum anode as well. So this is actually um, what this inspired us to do is actually we came up with a new, a new uh, galvanic anode. It's a new aluminum anode. It's actually called the Silver Bullet uh, Custom Aluminum Anode that's compatible with all of the different jacket systems that are out there. Um, it's a custom size and specifically designed for the jacket systems. Um, and it works also in those marine environments where you may have some concerns um, of the shellfish and some of the uh, uh, um, the marine life that's that's uh, locally there. You get more current output, and uh, as I mentioned, it's environmentally safer and uh, and it's designed for a purpose. So we're not just pulling something off the shelf and uh, installing it on a, on a, on the concrete pile that was used in originally for a, a ship. We're actually there's a specific purpose to the design of this anode. Uh, another area um, that we are looking at is uh, sheet pile wall or tidal zone protection. Um, what can be done here? Lots of times there's a concrete cap placed on the top of these uh, sheet pile walls or these uh, steel sheet pile walls, um, but then there's this tidal zone area. Um, lots of these sheet pile walls are, are uh, protected with a coating. The coating obviously fails over time and uh, can anything be done in this area? Is there something that we can use these jacket systems because they can be used on H pile or pipe piles? Can we utilize the same jacket technology on a sheet pile wall? So the next thing as well that I had mentioned was the tidal protection for uh, steel sheet pile walls um, or bulkhead walls. So we've been working on a number of other things with this as well. And again, this is a very difficult zone, that tidal zone. It's a really, really difficult place to protect, especially, you know, your coatings damaged and so forth. You can put bulk anodes, as you can see here in the picture on the right, bulk anode can easily protect everything in that water column. It's a very, very easy fix, but it's that tidal zone. So what we're developing or what we've developed is basically we're using that wicking technology or the DAS technology that activated or the high alkaline technology. And we're basically embedding these anodes in, an, in, a, in a stay in place form system that's going to be placed around uh, or adjacent to the uh, sheet pile wall. So then as well, down below, you're still going to utilize a bulk anode. Um, in this example here, 
what we have is we actually have the steel cores that are uh, cast in the uh, in the uh, anodes. We have those steel cores actually extended up so that they can be welded to the sheet pile wall outside of the outside of the wet zone. So it makes it easier for the contractor to install. So we have the bulk anodes welded to the sheet pile wall within the jacket limits there, and then the jacket either with the wicking technology. Um, or the, the uh, distributed anode technology is going to be placed in there. And now we're able to provide that galvanic protection to that tidal zone, which is also, a, a, again, a very difficult place to protect. Uh, a lot of the times as well, there's a concrete cap on top of this. So you can extend this jacket up to the bottom of that concrete cap on that sheet pile wall. So this brings me to the uh, conclusion of the last couple of slides. And basically what it is, is is we have we started off with the first generation expanded zinc mesh. It, uh, you know, worked well um, in that tidal zone in that area. Then we have developed and moved into a wicking technology or the tidal plus. And with that, we're able to extend that uh, activation or that galvanic uh, current uh, protection up to much higher elevations on the pile. And then for the areas where we don't actually have any salt water or we have a brackish water environment that we cannot rely on the salt water, um, then we have that uh, high alkaline uh, mortar that's basically our uh, the strip anodes are cast in. Um, and then we have that uh, alkaline activated um, system as well. So. And again, not only you can't just go in and just select one jacket, you have a corrosion problem on a pile. You can't just come in and just pick one specific jacket. You actually have to look at your environment. You know, what are your exposure zones? Can you use salt water to activate the zinc? If you can't use the salt water, do you have to go to an activated jacket system? How high up are you going? Are you just trying to protect down low in the water column? Or are you going up to that atmospheric area where you have a lot of chlorides present, potentially corrosion, but you don't have access to the salt water. Um, <clears throat> and then as well, um, can you use the uh, aluminum bulk anode for a higher current output as well with, uh, with the systems that are going to be uh, used? So and that basically ends the presentation here, and I thank everybody for joining me, and I guess we're going to uh, open it up to any questions um, if anybody has any. <clears throat> All right, excellent as usual, uh, Jason. Um, so I guess as a summary, um, if I if I get the the main message here is to pick the right uh, jacket technology for the application uh, and the environmental conditions, and to also consider designing the the submerged anode system kind of from the bottom up, taking consideration different factors like the electrical continuity of the piles in the size of the piles. Yeah, but, exactly. Um, OK, um, so just just a follow up on that from from myself. Can you just elaborate on what is electrical continuity and why is it important? So the electrical continuity is just basically to see whether or not the steel within the structure or specifically, I guess what we were talking about here, the pile. So we want to make sure that all of the steel in the pile is all basically touching each other um, or electrically touching each other so that when we do hook an anode up to it, that the anode is going to protect all of the steel within that structure. For example, a lot of times on uh, precast pre-stress uh, pre piles, you'll have the spiral tie that goes around. A lot of times, the uh, pre-stressing strands, a lot of them are not continuous with the spiral tie or with the other uh, with the other strands. So if you put a system on and you didn't check that, you would not be protecting those strands that were discontinuous. Yeah. Um, well, excellent. And um, one other uh, point I thought be worth maybe elaborating on you. You mentioned um, when you're when you're pumping concrete, you have two different options. You can use the base effectively exterior ports that are in the bottom of the jacket in the submerged areas or a, a, a pumping tube. Can you just elaborate on the, the those uh, different application methods? Yeah, and so traditionally pump our uh, pumping ports have been used and and uh, 
typically they're placed roughly about a foot off the bottom of the jacket and they're on opposite sides of the jacket approximately about every four feet and it depends of course on the size of the pile and so forth but that's typically what was done and and it's kind of a tedious and and a lot of labor involved especially if you're a diver trying to move a, a, a concrete hose around in the water uh, connecting to all these pumping uh, uh, ports. So there also is another option of pump tubes and basically it's just you'll have two two pump tubes um, that are placed down on each side of the jacket on opposite sides of the jacket and they essentially go down to the bottom of the jacket and they have breakaway ports. So they'll generally connect to it with like a T fitting and they can just run their concrete pump and pu uh, pump the grout into those pump ports and as the material rises, as the grout rises, these breakaway ports just keep opening up so you get good grout consolidation as well. So it's a pretty easy method of doing it. Okay. Excellent, excellent. But well, we do have some good questions from the, uh, the attendees today, and uh, I'll jump around a bit, but um, I guess uh, just um, if we start, if we start with, uh, with Danny, I was kind of, he's curious about the wicking fabric do you know what the composition of the wicking fabric is, fabric is and how durable? So it's basically kind of like a glass, a glass fabric um, and, and it's actually quite durable. Um, you don't want to leave it um, as it's being installed. You want to make sure that you close the jacket up and pump it. You don't want to leave it out there for weeks on end or anything like that. Um, but once it's once the grout is actually poured back, um, it's not uh, affected by the high alkalinity of the grout or the concrete, um, so it can withstand all of that um, as well. So it's very durable um, once it's out in basically embedded or uh, cast with concrete. Excellent, excellent. Um, Colt um, asked the question, what service life do you expect from the jackets? Uh, and any he specifically mentions a highly corrosive environment okay that's a good question so i would say what we've been moving to as well as when we were talking about the advancements was before it was a lot of off the shelf stuff that we would just take put in for example zinc mesh or the hull anode there was only one size that you could really get um with the newer technologies what we can do is we can change the spacing of those anodes within the jacket limits and then as well we have a specific design for that bulk anode so we are typically on average designing for roughly about a 25 year service life and we can extend that by basically increasing the amount of zinc or the amount of of uh, anodes that we have within the jacket so 25 years is is pretty typical um, even for fairly aggressive environments, um, and then we can increase it to there. And we've done things up to 40 years plus as well. Yeah, excellent. Uh, we have a couple questions. I'll just combine into one um, <clears throat> general comments about utilizing these types of technologies for new construction. Yeah, so in, in new construction, so so for example, uh, a sheet pile wall or even some pipe piles or H piles, even if they do have a coating on them, I mean, of course, it would be a good thing if we could have a coating on it. So you can install especially bulk anodes on all of those structures right when they are new, right from new construction. Um, what that's going to do is it's right away, it's going to start protecting those structures or any of those holidays or scratches or defects in, for example, sheet pile. You know, when you're installing sheet pile on a job site, there's going to be a lot of defects that happen to it just during the installation process. And so as you do that, um, you can install the anodes on there. And because you have a coating on it, you're going to actually require a lot less anodes because you do not have very much steel exposed. So you don't need a large amount of galvanic current to protect it. Um, Sherry has a two part question, which I'm just going to paraphrase because it's fairly detailed, but effectively uh, part A is can you mix and match um, the different types of anodes? What can you use wicking and the alkali activated anode, for example? And then uh, the part B um, is um, since they are corroding, do they need to be eventually replaced? Yeah, so the so obviously the wicking um, or the tidal plus anode is used in that wet area and the and the DASs for the dry areas. 
And so, yes, they can be used together. I mean, it's just zinc. Um, so it's been used together in a number of jobs and there's no issues with that. Um, and then to the second question is, can they be replaced? And so they can, I mean, they're not, they're not designed to be a replaceable um, system like a battery would be, um, but they can be replaced. And, and that has been happening, um, you know, because these, uh, especially with the zinc mesh systems, the zinc mesh jackets, they've been installed now for 20 plus years. And so some of these jackets have been coming to the end of their service life. And so basically you just go in, peel the jacket off, take the bulk anode off and put a new one on. Excellent. Um, I guess this is an interesting question, or it is an interesting question from Venu. Um, uh, basically, instead of using alkali activated system in dry areas, can it, can you use a distributed anode embedded in concrete? Or I guess for that matter, for the discrete anode. So instead of using um, a jacket. Yeah. In, in dry areas. Yeah, yeah. So as you move up, right, exactly. So you're just basically working with an alkali activated anode and so then it would perform in the same in the same fashion. You wouldn't have to ha have the jacket system. Again, a lot of times the jacket system is used to help actually prevent oxygen and uh, basically just helps the system function. So as you move up, if you wanted to just use a regular um, removable form in that area, you could as well. I would probably just add to that um, if if you're in a situation where you have very little damage um, versus a, a, a pile that has more damage, maybe the jacketing system makes more sense because it's a repair method yeah, uh, you're doing at, the same way, at the same time. But um, yeah, so uh, another interesting question here. Um, from uh, anonymous if you want to send your name in anonymous you'll have a, a chance for the gift card um, how does the vendor work with the contractor in placing these systems uh, or is a contractor installed so is, is it is it is the question is the contractor install installing yes. it? Is it is it installed by contractors and how do the vendors work with the contractors yeah and so so basically yeah, exactly. So the uh, obviously we would supply the system and then and then, uh, you know, um, depending upon the vendor as well, um, we can supply it to the vendor and then obviously the vendor would supply it to the contractor and then the contractor would be doing the installation for it. Um, and there would be and then if there was any sort of support needed, um, then obviously vector corrosion can provide any support or anything like that that would be required for the contractor. Yeah. And the vendor. I would also just add on many of these types of projects that are larger, larger projects, and you'll have a cathodic protection specialist involved that's doing some quality control as well uh, and they can Correct. provide support. Yeah. Basically a uh, corrosion engineer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Michael, um, how, how high does the saltwater wick up? He's talking about 20 feet above high water. Will the water wick up 20 feet? So from from all the results that we have and all of the, obviously the the uh, the design, what we're typically seeing is you're seeing roughly about six to eight feet is what you can see the wicking technology work at. So roughly about two meters, give or take. So as you get up to 20, 20 feet, you're going to have to switch to the activated, um, the DAS, the activated technology. Yeah, going to the self-activated anodes at that at that point. Yeah. Um, Bill, this is uh, this is really really good. Um, is there basically any danger using zinc anodes cast in new concrete? Um, he basically says that the zinc does not does not activate well in fresh or low pH concrete. Uh, effectively, what, what would you think about new new concrete piles? So putting zinc in new concrete piles. Yeah. So yeah. Um, you know that what's going to happen with that as well if you just put pure zinc or plain zinc anodes into there it's going to passivate and they're really not going to produce any current for you um so that still wouldn't be you know that would not be optimum at all um to yeah. do that yeah so, i guess if you would use if you want to cast and we uh, we've done this many times uh per, galvanic protection into new concrete new concrete piles we would use Anodes are designed to be embedded in concrete, which are not. They're right. Really, uh, For example, you could use the you could use the DAS 
nanotechnology to put it into the new uh, the new uh, uh, concrete pile wraps as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, he also had a part B, and I think this will probably be our last uh, last question here is what type of preparation should take place for existing spalled piles and corroded steel? OK, so it was if you kind of remember going back to a couple of the slides back, back two thirds of the way through the presentation was you're going to want to go in and if you have large cracking spalls, you just want to go in and remove any of the deteriorated concrete. Um, so you're just going to remove the deteriorated concrete. Typically in that marine environment, you're going to have marine growth. So they're going to scrape off the marine growth. You can use a high pressure washer blast to also clean off the marine growth. So you want to just have a, a clean pile and then obviously clean your steel at the same time. So we want to be able to get a decent bond, a bond to it. And then you'll just place your jacket around it and then and, and fill it with your grout after your anodes have been attached. Excellent. Final thoughts, Jason, maybe you want to reiterate any comments related to forming systems, PVC, FRP and the like? Yeah, I think it, it, it just depends upon maybe the environment, how tall, um, also even maybe job location as well. So uh, uh, PVC comes in, in uh, basically it's modular, it's fairly easy to get into tighter places and so forth. And I think as well as to, is to just remember that, that these systems are, are um, a design system um, and for each specific structure or project, you're gonna wanna look at it and see what the needs are for it. How many anodes do you need? How many bulk anodes do you need? Um, and especially if you're only looking at a few piles on a structure, um, don't just look at just the one specific pile that has a problem. You're gonna have to um, make sure that you include the surrounding areas. Uh, just due to the influence. Yeah, excellent, excellent. All right, well, we had lots of great questions and um, unfortunately we're running out of time. Uh, so we have uh, two options. We will provide the full list of questions to, to Jason so he can follow up directly with you. And then also um, he can select the winner of the gift card. Um, but if you if you are anxious and you can't wait for Jason to get back with you, uh, we've given you his full details, pretty much everything except for his home address on there. So you can uh, definitely track him down as you as you need it. But Jason, thank you so much. It was an excellent presentation and a very lively Q and A. All right, thank you everybody for joining. And just one more note: this, like I mentioned at the very beginning, this is the third of four episodes in the uh, marine preservation uh, in webinar series the next one next one is uh, in a month from now in december and um, this will be uh, more case studies on cathodic protection in marine structures and yours truly will be presenting that so i encourage you to sign up and hopefully it'll be very interesting to uh, to your interest here and, um, and, and come back to visit uh, we will be uh, uploading the slides and the, and the videos uh, to that for this today's seminar in case you have any colleagues who were unable to attend. But thank you very much for your time and, and your interest and your dedication to concrete repair, structure preservation, and the like. So let's all go save some structures. Have a great day.